Hello and welcome to the Friday, December 20th, 2019 edition of Tesla Daily on official Tesla podcast. My name is Rob Maurer. We have some news to go through today and I also wanted to take a look at international vehicle registrations as we near the end of the quarter. Tesla stock continued to rise today, though not as high as we saw in the pre-market and early trading, finishing the day up 0.4% to $405.59. That compared to the NASDAQ also up 0.4%. All right, let's start with vehicle registrations, and we're going to look at China, the Netherlands, Norway, and Spain as we get pretty good quarter-to-date updates in those markets. As we learned in the Alex Potter interview, China aggregates registration data. It's probably not perfect and it's going to lag behind actual deliveries, but still interesting to look at nonetheless. And then as we've discussed in the past from the Netherlands, Norway, and Spain, we get daily updates on registrations. So really good live data as we move through the quarter. So on China, yesterday Bloomberg reported on this and they are citing the China Automotive Information Net as aggregating this data. And they're reporting that just under 5,600 Teslas were registered in China in the month of November. That compares to 393 in November of last year. Now that's just a one month look. So as we know, those aren't necessarily material. A better comparison would probably be to the first two months of Q3. So let's take a look at how those compare. July and August reportedly combined to be about 4,600 vehicles. So that's the first two months of Q3. And then October and November combined end up being about 6,400 vehicles. So from a registration perspective, that's about a 39% increase quarter over quarter through the end of November. And looking at this data sort of month by month, I don't know how far registrations would lag deliveries. I'm guessing not really that far because if you look at how these numbers look month over month, you see these big spikes in March, June, and then to a lesser extent in September. Those are all obviously the last month in their respective quarters, which is when we would expect to see the spike in deliveries due to international batching. So to see the spike in registrations follow that same cadence probably indicates that there's not a huge lag between delivery and registration, which is a good thing, meaning the value of it isn't too thrown off due to any significant lag in time there. The cautionary point to consider here is that December 15th was the scheduled date for the 25% additional tariff on U.S. auto imports into China. That didn't end up happening, but that deadline was looming, and that may have shifted Tesla's prioritization of delivering in China up earlier in the quarter to help avoid that additional 25% tariff. So I don't think there's a good way of knowing how much inventory might be available to actually deliver and register in December, but the good news is that in Q3, total registrations for the quarter were only about 7,900 vehicles. So to match that, Tesla would only need to deliver about 1,500 more in December. This year, Tesla's only had three months that were below that level, January, February, and then October. And obviously all of those are early in the month quarters. The other factor is Gigafactory Shanghai deliveries. Those numbers could impact you for It's still unclear to me whether or not those deliveries are going to happen. I know some people are reporting that they are. I don't think we've gotten any clear confirmation of that yet. So with all the back and forth information that we've had from China so far, I'm definitely not counting on it until we see for sure someone has taken delivery and they've reported on that delivery. Even without Gigafactory Shanghai, depending on how much inventory Tesla actually shipped to China, there's still a good shot for Q4 to outpace Q3 in China. Moving on then to Europe, specifically the Netherlands, Norway, and Spain, we're seeing some really, really exciting stuff here. As we talked about in Q3, that was already a record-setting quarter for these countries with about 12,300 registrations during the quarter, which beat the previous record from Q1 of 2019 of about 10,400 registrations. 80 days into this quarter, so still plenty of time remaining here before the end of the quarter, obviously, they've already registered about 13,500 vehicles in these three countries in Q4. That's already 9% higher than last quarter, which was again, a record. And we still have a week and a half left in the quarter. Over the last week, these countries have been registering Teslas at a rate of about 535 per day, which if that rate continues, we could see another 6,000 or so vehicles registered in these countries before the end of the quarter. At this same point in time in Q3, registrations were about 7,500 vehicles. So relative to the same point in time, Tesla's registered 
80% more. 80% more quarter to date in these countries. Needless to say, this is definitely something we'll be keeping an eye on through the rest of the quarter. But exciting to see these numbers from China and super, super exciting to see these numbers from the Netherlands, Norway, and Spain. There are tax changes coming at the end of the year in the Netherlands, so that's one of the reasons that demand is so high right now in that country. We talked about that a bit at the beginning of the quarter, but I do still want to go into more detail on that, so that's still in the plans at some point. The next topic today is Gigafactory 4. We have news from multiple European outlets that Tesla has agreed and signed a contract with Brandenburg to purchase the property that Gigafactory 4 will be built on. This does still need to be approved by state parliament as well as Tesla's board of directors, which obviously I would have no concerns about Tesla's side of that. And from the commentary today from German officials, it doesn't seem like state parliament should be an issue either. So a nice milestone here for Tesla and gives us a nice basis for comparison to Gigafactory Shanghai. So I went back and looked at when Tesla signed the agreement to purchase that land, and that was on October 17th of 2018. So from then, it took about 13, 14 months to start production. I think we all do and should expect Gigafactory Berlin to take longer than Gigafactory Shanghai, but that 14-month time horizon would put us in mid-February of 2021. So even adding, you know, 50% or six months puts us into Q3 of 2021, which I think at this point is a pretty reasonable cushion, though of course we'll get a much better feel for that when construction actually begins. Next up today, I wanted to talk about a software update that is announced for Tesla in China. This was reported on Twitter by Ray for Tesla. He shared the official communication from Tesla that in Q1, they will be releasing an update that includes three really popular online games there, Fight Landlords, Majan, and Happy Upgrade, alongside two streaming services and a local weather app, plus air quality alerts. The video games are particularly exciting for a couple of reasons. Number one, the online capability. Unless I'm mistaken, we haven't seen that online multiplayer aspect yet from any of the Tesla games that have been released to date. Obviously, that's a huge element for gaming. And then the second piece is that these are all owned by Tencent, which also owns a 5% stake in Tesla. So seeing a continued closer partnership between those two companies could be a very strong thing for Tesla. And while this is completely, completely speculative, I would not be surprised if Tencent continued to increase its investment. And it also wouldn't shock me if that was part of the reason for the recent run-up that we've seen in Tesla. By the way, and I'm sure most listeners would agree with this, things like this are why I don't really have any concern about Tesla's brand in China. I think they're going to completely cut through as a premium, high-tech, fun brand because that is what they are. Either way, I think this is a particularly exciting update. I think that socialization element is an important one and one that I hope continues and one that I expect to continue to get played up in all markets. There's so much potential there, even from something as simple as Tesla-specific leaderboards. I just think that socialization element is so important and a big part of our world. If Tesla can capture some of the value of that and integrate it into their products, that's going to be a big win. Next up today, I want to dive into more of that speculative category and look at some tweets from user Green the Only on Twitter, very green on other platforms. He spends a lot of time looking through code in Tesla's vehicles and often notices pretty interesting things tucked away in there. And today is one of those days. He posted a thread with some of the most interesting things he's been seeing recently. And in my opinion, two of the most interesting are that in the Model 3 code, there are references to both a 100 kilowatt hour pack, and to ludicrous mode. Now, these references have been there since March of 2019, so this isn't indicative of anything imminent. And obviously, they could just be references to something related to Model S or Model X that's still in the Model 3 code. The reason it's particularly interesting is that Very Green is saying that previously there was a lot of code that was referenced in the Model 3 that was actually related to Model S and Model X that has since been purged from the specific Model 3 code. And yet, these references remain. So again, this is extremely speculative. I wouldn't put much weight in this, but we know that Elon has said in the past that ludicrous mode would eventually come to Model 3, and we haven't yet seen that. I think at one point he also said that a 100 kilowatt hour pack would be too big to fit in a Model 3, but it's been a while, and maybe it's progressed to the point where that is now possible. If that were the case, that would mean a Model 3 
with greater than 400 miles of range. So again, not putting much weight in that. And again, it's been in the code since March, but I thought an interesting note worth passing along. Next story is on Mercedes today, and this is coming from the Financial Times, which is reporting that several Mercedes dealerships expect Mercedes to significantly cut back on delivery of the AMG versions of Mercedes-Benz vehicles. AMG is the high-performance division of Mercedes-Benz and as such carries a higher margin, but also carries higher emissions. So the report here is saying that in an effort to reduce emissions going forward, AMG could be severely cut back. The report here is saying maybe up to 75%. 2020s are going to be a really, really tough decade for these other automakers. I mean, they're facing more competition in those premium spaces. Tesla is obviously moving in on that turf with the Model 3 and the Model Y. And these emission standards are then coming down, reducing profitability. And all of this is happening at the same time that they need to be making significant investments into electric vehicles and into autonomy. If this AMG stuff does come to fruition, I think that's a really bad sign for Mercedes and for Daimler. Last thing today, I just want to close talking about some of my thoughts on the stock price right now. I've been thinking about this a lot, obviously. And one thing that I used to talk about a little bit more than I've been talking about recently is that the market likes volatility because market makers make money on volatility. I think we experienced some of that earlier this year in June when the stock price just steeply, steeply nosedived. And a lot of people got caught in bad trades which again, somebody makes money on those. So I think we saw that on the downside earlier this year. And I think right now we're potentially in a place where there's going to be this upward pressure applied to sort of facilitate that same thing happening again in reverse. I've pretty frequently argued against the short squeeze mentality because I think that's something that happens very suddenly. But there's probably a pretty good opportunity here for the share price to kind of get forced up and ride this momentum and force some of this covering, in which case, yeah, maybe you can call that a short squeeze. I do still wish there'd be some different terminology for something like that situation versus like a true spike of a short squeeze like we saw with Volkswagen or dry ships, etc. Those truly like crazy spikes. But hey, when that momentum is there, why not continue to apply that upward pressure and make money off of that volatility? I mean, I already discussed earlier this week why I am still bullish at these levels, and especially as we get closer and closer to these Q4 delivery numbers that are showing increasing signs of being pretty strong numbers, combining that with the realization that, hey, there's an opportunity here to take advantage of some of this volatility. I don't know. I think this is going to be a really, really interesting next couple of weeks. I'm always pretty heavily invested in Tesla, but I continue to kick myself for not being more heavily invested, and I now thinking about through all this stuff throughout the day and wishing I would have made some more short-term moves, but I was traveling all day while the markets were open, and I didn't really get a chance to sit down and think about it until after the close. So Monday's going to be interesting. My bet's on up. We'll see. Before we do close out today, though, I just want to say a huge, huge, huge thank you to everybody supporting the podcast on Patreon And to those of you that checked out that video equipment wish list that I posted earlier this week, really appreciate that. Super helpful. This will be my last plug for that, but that'll be in the show notes for a couple more days if you want to check that out. And of course, you can always find more information about supporting the podcast at patreon.com slash Tesla Daily Podcast. This week, I want to say a huge thank you to our new silver supporters, Wax Circus, Michael Schroeder, Norman Pettis, Brandon Smith, and Sadir Mulkey. And then as always, huge thank you to our ludicrous producer, Vincent Smith. Our platinum producers, Rob Gill, Rish Singh, Nick Wood, Phelo Vinkelmullen, and Troy Cherisaro. And our platinum supporters, Will Brocklebank, Trillium Smith, Evan Stair, Ty and David Dundas, Rick Sinta, Todd Luddington, Tesla in the Gong, Christopher Botang, Brad Rode, Alan Rudnick, Timothy O'Grady II, Andre Kent, and Saeed. And of course, our gold supporters, including Jeremy Cook, Joel Sapp, Andrea Fabretto, Michael Pastroni, Robert Maracol, Brett Young, Craig Murphy, Julian Roloff, Anders Refeld, Tyler Crawford, The Goobermans, Guy Masters, Daniel Erickson, Joris Pomans, Nathan Lucht, Gregor Weisgerber, James Smith, Joe Bush, Amir Tobani, Tim Turnstrom, Brian Karotis, Nick Mark, Ron Rubico, Matthew Lipton, Brian Anderson, Tony Naff, Pat O'Shea, Felix Cranberg, Kelly Bergman, Dwight Schum, Samuel Zong, Pitt Hot Stettler, Callum Burnett, Jason Daly, Urban Linuscog, Paul Dobbins, Bien Concepcion, Anders Jensen, Mike McHenry, Stephen Lewis, Daniel Landy, John Ferreira, Will Berger, 
Brian Scanlon, Mark Zilka, Dale Lutz, Lars, Chris Dasbach, Karan Verandani, Nils Engelking, Christian Moore, Jeff Lowe, Steve F., Christopher Bauko, Burton Torgerson, Andrew Clark, Josh Sheebloom, Brad Lettner, Spencer Cravel, Peter Kuba, Jeff Trapino, Michael Thomas, Dustin Hart, Crypto Dread, Nicholas Lutowski, Lewis Ferris, Sam Passig, Danny Hughes, Greg Nichols, Paul Veeger, Eric DeBrun, Doug Wandell, Ali Nasri, Roger McMorrow, Matthias Monkmeyer, Joseph Pye, Alan Levy, Brian Terry, Paul Meester, Jim Prehoda, Chris Duggar, Eric Stewart, Kos Kosmas, Joshua Kessler, Christopher Carroll, Seamus Johnson, Duncan Ashworth, Peter Vanderlin, and Matthew Levin. Thank you all so much. Have an awesome weekend, and I'll see you on Monday for the December 23rd episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.